Good morning, LCC family and friends, and welcome to Church at Home. Psalm 118 says this, This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So let's honor the word of the Lord today. Gather the family, grab your Bible and your notebook, put away all the distractions, and find a comfortable spot. And if you can, put the service up on your TV so the whole family can participate together. Sing with us out loud. If you have an instrument, you can play along with us. And before we start to worship today, take a moment right now to invite the Holy Spirit to fill your home with the presence of the Lord. Be blessed today. We can't wait till we can worship together in one place in this building again. But until then, it's time to praise the Lord. Work together for my 
declare it this morning. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things, you make all things work together. fails me your love never fails me Lord for you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who you are way maker miracle Keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker, way maker, miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Miracle work, promise keep. 
deep light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are the way maker way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are well we praise you lord come on and lift up a praise to the lord this morning lord you're worthy of praise from our homes we praise you wherever we are we praise you lord because today is the day you've made and we will rejoice and be glad in you praise the lord praise the lord praise the lord well good morning leamington christian center to everyone who's listening to us today welcome you and hope that you're having a great time in your living room, your bedroom, your family room, wherever you may be listening today or even in your car. It's an honor to be able to speak to you and come into your homes and into your life. And pray that whatever we say today through the word of God is a blessing to you. I have something on my heart I'm anxious to share with you. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, a wise man heart understands the times and judges correctly and that he will apply his heart to know, to perceive, to understand. The same writer, I believe, Solomon said in the book of Proverbs to get wisdom and with all you're getting, get understanding to pursue it, to seek it like you seek silver. We're living in a time where we need wisdom more than ever before. And in this season where we're off work, more or less, and have certain restrictions, it's a good time to change our habits. We take a look at our cultural shifts as of late, and we have time to think. Our culture has, in its busyness, dictated to us, we have less time for thinking, less time for admiring, less time for spending time together. We text a lot. And we're usually never really still, calm, and able to think because of the texts constantly, the videos, and all the electronic media. Busyness has seemed to sweep us away. And in our culture, there's been thoughts that have interjected to our culture that have interfered with the way we behave. One of the thoughts of recent years is, you can't tell me what to do. I have my rights. You just can't tell me what to do and I won't listen to you and I don't have to. And that kind of thinking has repercussions and it has changed our culture. As a pendulum swings, we need to be cognizant of the fact of how far it may go in that direction. I used to own a boat and... I went fishing with a friend to Pelee Island, which is about 15 miles off of our shore south. The fishing was good, and we stayed past dark. And on the way back home in the dark, my compass was off by five degrees. Doesn't sound like a lot, just a small little touch. But by the time we thought we've got to Leamington, we were in another town. When you take a small variance on your steering wheel over a period of time, it can take you further than you ever want to go. And our thinking patterns of recent times have taken us places, and some of them aren't so good. And we have a good time to rethink, readjust, and make changes in the way we think. We need to be able to go forward with care and management of the way we think. Because this type of thinking that I just mentioned, you can't tell me what to do, has brought us into a culture of children and youth and even adults that are very disrespectful. Respect for teachers, respect for officials, respect for police is at an all-time low. We have this term that we've come up with in our culture in recent times that I never heard when I was very young because I'm still young. It's called politically correct, which means this. We're more concerned 
about how something looks and how something sounds rather than the right thing or the truth of the matter. We don't want to be open to criticism. So we want to bring forth our statements based on the way it looks, the way, the way we're thought of. We aren't really looking for the truth or what's the right thing. We're looking for uh, how much we will receive votes and how popular we are. This busyness, to me, has created three really big problems in our culture. The first one I can say is a lack of appreciation for the Lord, for God. We're too busy. Too busy to appreciate His creation. He made us. The Bible says, this is the day that the Lord has made. So Lord made this day. Man didn't make the day. God made this day. Whether you believe in Him or not, time is a blessing and it's a gift from God to live in. Health is a blessing. And with all of our busyness, in many cases, we haven't taken time for God or to appreciate what he's done for us or our blessings. It's a good time to take time for God, especially all you fathers or single mothers or single fathers. A good time to bring the Bible back into the home, dust it off and open it up and start to read it. It's a good time to start your day with acknowledging God made a day for us. See, today, this day, has never, ever been before. What's the date today? April 19th, thank you. April 19th, 2020 has never, ever been before. This is a new day. We base what we're thinking what's going to happen today on what's happened yesterday, but we really know from recent experience, everything can change in a very quick time. With this busyness, we don't take time to worship, and we don't take time especially to be thankful. So if there is a God, and he did make the day, we ought to be thankful. We ought to be thankful for it. Oh, I know, life has challenges. I've had challenges in my own life and loss. But still, we need to be thankful for what we do have. The second thing I believe that this busyness has affected us harmfully is we've lost an appreciation for one another, for people, for our family, taking them for granted, for our friends, for our neighbors. Many people that we love and we're in close quarters, we've neglected to be totally appreciative for them because when you're in close quarters, you can rub each other wrong. So I'm going to invent a machine it's a dream anyway that'll make me rich. It's a machine where you put people inside and it knocks all the rough edges off. Because a lot of us have such rough edges and we're so set in our ways that we're inflexible and we're not tolerant and we have no mercy. So I'm going to take people and I'll charge them just a small fee, put them in the machine, stir it around and it'll knock all the rough edges off. So when they come out, they'll come out soft and nice and smiling. Of course, uh, I'm not sure how to invent that machine yet, but if I could do it, it would really be a blessing. We've forgotten how to appreciate neighbors. I'm still very young, but I can remember as a child where neighbors blessed one another. They watched out for one another. You could borrow from one another. You, you helped one another. And that's rare today. Uh, it's free to bless a neighbor. It's free to share an excess that you have with a neighbor. But in this hour, which we live of such busyness and with this attitude, you can't tell me what to do. Many people don't even know their next door neighbor, let alone the neighbors on all their street. But it used to be we knew our neighbors all the way down the street. And we watched out for one another and blessed one another. I can remember when I was a kid and my uncle got married. Those were days when people didn't have a lot. So my grandfather gave him the garage next door. And I remember several neighbors coming over and turning that garage into a one bedroom apartment, never charging a penny or a dime. They were fed, they were happy, and they were blessed to be a blessing. Why can't we go back to that today? But this busyness that we have and these attitudes that we've developed have taken us to another place where we we're not appreciative of the people around us. We're not lovers like we used to be. We can influence children 
so much good or wrong. We can encourage them and bless them, do good deeds with them, take time with them, mentor them, and it doesn't cost us anything. And it can change a life. With this attitude, we've lost discipline and order. Oh, a year or so ago, a friend of mine took me to a University of Michigan football game. Now, those watching, you may be blue, you may be green, you may be red. That's not the point. The point is they were playing Army that day. And when the marching band came out, I literally cried in my seat to see such order, such discipline, such marching in unison. No one out of order. It's not a common situation that we see anymore in our society. You can't tell me what to do so I can march the way I want to march and march to my own music. When I saw that band come forth, all in order, all marching in unison, with their uniforms, all pressed, all in order, it just touched something in my heart to let me know we've lost something and we need to get it back. I can remember as a child, small porch on my grandmother's house where many adults gathered and all of us cousins played and it didn't cost money. We had one bat and one ball. The bat had a nail in it and the ball was mostly black tape after the cover got knocked off, but we were happy and had a blast. We played together. But our culture was affected. It was affected because as we prospered, we got more interested in materialism and keeping up with the Joneses than we did with loving one another and the greatest pleasures of life. It's not that people didn't like to dress. They dressed the best they could. But it seemed like in our culture, we respected people for the best they had without putting them down. But I remember when I was young, Going to school, we were starting to prosper. Madras shirts came into style and Weijin shoes. And if you went to school without a Madras shirt and Weijin shoes, you just weren't in the clique. I remember the first Madras shirt that my mother was able to buy my brother and I. And then, to top it off, one day we got Weijin shoes. Madras shirt and Weijin shoes. But you know what? It's never stopped. We're still competing with one another for materialistic views, but it isn't prospered us in our hearts and in our culture as a warmth of people, and we need to be careful. Right now, we have the time to make some changes, break these habits, think a little bit, get back to what's really most important. In school, when I went, I read a book by Henry David Thoreau called On Walden Pond. He made a statement in there. In this hour, we've built bigger and bigger houses, more customized, more beautiful, but we haven't built bigger and bigger people to live in those houses. And I didn't know what he meant as I began to think about it. I understood that our technologies improved, but our hearts, discipline, respect, honor, integrity hasn't improved. Our materialism has improved but not the goodness of a people group. I was thinking about photographs. Photographs in my old albums that from way back when, and photographs of today. And I noticed something. In photographs of old times, they took pictures of their fun so they could remember the fun they're having. But in our photographs today, we're trying to photograph that we're having fun. It's not really that we're photographing the fun we're having. We're trying to show other people and compete with other people. Hey, look, we're having fun, so let's all do something crazy for the photograph. Do you understand the difference? It was that in olden times, there wasn't a concern what other people thought. We're having fun. Let's take a photo in remembrance of this great time we're having. But nowadays, we're taking these photos trying to show other people that we're having as much fun as them. And we're not really looking down deep into the heart of the issue, the heart of the matter, and being real with the life we've been given and blessed with the life we've been given and living in the love of the Lord. What's the most important things to us? What's the most important thing to you? 
We need to evaluate these things and understand what is most important. I was aware of a business that was abusing employees, really taking advantage, overworking and not really being understanding of um, things that could be worked out to bless the employee and not hurt the business at all. So over a period of time, a union came in to get the employees together to say, hey, we, we're tired of the abuse. We want to create a great product for you. We want to, we're blessed to work here, but we can't handle these um, restrictive controls that are hurtful. So the union came together and initially it brought a correction to many things. But we have to watch out for this fleshly condition in us as, as the pendulum can swing too far. And in the course of time it did. Because then the union said, oh, he's taken off so much work, but we're going to support him and you can't fire him. And yes, he stole once from you, but that's not a big deal. You cannot fire that employee. And so the corruption came in. The pendulum swung too far in the wrong direction. And it's caused problems. We constantly need to use our brains to do course correction. Many times, increase and in success take us to a destination where we lose our hunger, lose our ability to pursue, lose our ability to learn, lose our ability to strive for something better. When the people first came to North America, they came out of an abuse, they came out of a need for freedom. They came poor, but they came to a land where they could be their own and, and be free and work and strive and make a living. And it took place. But we need to be cautious of this prosperity because once prosperity came, North America, to me, that was a production, produced many products, invented many products, distributed much good to the world, has now, in its relaxation, lost that ability we lost motivation. We lost appreciation. We lost the pursuit of the things that we once pursued because we got full. When you're hungry, you're looking with energy for pursuit of something. When you're physically hungry, well, you go to the refrigerator. But when your soul is hungry, you're hungry for to achieve. You're hungry to pursue. You're hungry to learn. You're hungry to study. When we get full, sometimes we lose this pursuit. We lose this energy and we need to learn. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart for out of your heart comes the dictates of life. Guard your heart with, with all discretion. It becomes important for us to reevaluate. It becomes important for us to pursue. It becomes important for us to Follow the Lord. Very, very important. So we ask again, what's the most important to us today? What's the most important to you? Is God in your list of importance? Is your family in your list of importance? Are your friends important to you? What, what there is in life is the most important things to you. And those things are the things we need to spend time with. We have the time right now. And I don't think it's going to last long. At least I'm hoping that it doesn't last very long. Where we can make some adjustments. Where we can jump off the merry-go-round for a moment. And take an evaluation of what's the most important to us. Who's the most important to us? And ask some questions. Is it really that I want to pursue keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak? When you have two parents working, and I'm not critical of any, it may be by necessity, but just to get a bigger house and a bigger car and leave the children unattended, and let the schools have them for six hours and then home alone for three or four hours and then maybe 20 minutes with them in the evening. That's happened a lot. Then what's our answer? 
where our answer is this, we'll take a really big vacation to an expensive place and we'll have a blast for a week or two. But that doesn't fix the 355 other days where we didn't spend time with each other or learn to talk to each other or love one another or tell each other that we loved one another. So I'm asking you today to take some time to think. And I'm asking myself, for myself, what's the most important to me? I have four daughters. I have a life. God's given me a life. It's a gift. He created me. What's the most important? And as we close today, I want to ask you something about the most important thing of life complete is a savior. Do you have a savior? Do you know there is a savior? Do you know that Jesus Christ was sent to planet earth to be our savior? He didn't come to hurt us. He didn't come to cheat you, rob you, or take advantage of you. He came as a love gift to save you. That's why he came for you. When we partake of communion and read the words that he said, he said, take this and eat it. It's broken for you. Take this and drink it. It's the sacrifice I'm making. I'm doing it for you. He's a savior. He came to take care of the sin problem. Oh, you may say you've never hurt anybody, but not only the sin problem of what we do outwardly, but the iniquity problem of what we think inwardly. A whole nother story. But God sees through everything. The Bible says he's numbered the hairs on your head. What a job that is. It has to be God that can only do that. For some people it's a big job and for some it's an easy job. But he's numbered the hairs on our head. And he came to take away the inequity. Not only does the Savior do those things, but he came to help us, give us wisdom, direction, purpose, focus. Not only did he come to give us direction and purpose in life, but he came to fulfill the things that are lacking in the human condition, not to control us, but to bless us to be what we were made to be. Whether you know it or not, you were made to be either a son or a daughter of a living God. We have earthly fathers. We're thankful. We must we should honor them because the Bible tells us to honor our mother and father, which is another thing that in recent cultural shifts, since we've been told we don't have to take that from anyone, it's even come into the house where we have to say to our parents, we don't have to take that from anyone. So nowadays, the society almost tells the parents you're irrelevant and your children have privacy and we don't even need to tell you about their physical conditions or their health concerns or anything about them. I say the pendulum swaying too far the wrong way and we need to bring it back. But back to my conclusion. Do you have a savior? So today as we conclude today's message, I know it was a little different. I just wanted to share my heart with you through this time. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. And if you're aware that you need a savior, if you really take a look inside, you'll conclude that you need a savior. And he's here to be that savior for you. And it's obtained by faith. We don't understand faith, but let me assure you, according to the Bible, God understands faith. It's like this. If you wanted to buy an iPad... When you go to the store, you would need cash or what represents it, a credit card or a check. If you went to the store and said, I want to buy it, I'll buy it by faith. They'll laugh at you and you'll leave without an iPad. But if you need something from God, you're not going to get it with cash or a credit card or a check. The mode of operation in heaven is faith, is belief. And heaven can smell it, can see it, and sense it. So if you invite the Savior into your heart by faith, that you believe that he is real, and that you do need him because you need to be saved, you can have that fulfillment right now. 
So if that's your condition today, or you're away from the Lord, and in times like this, you've been thinking, I've strayed. In my prosperity, I left God. In my ease, I went back to a sinful place. You need to come home, and you need to come home today. You can pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, I believe you're real. And I believe you love me. And I believe you're the Savior. And I need one. So I'm asking you to forgive me for all my sins, all my wrongs, anything I ever did that didn't please you or hurt someone. I open my heart and I receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I'm asking you to be the substitute, the payment for my sin to Father God so that I can make heaven my home and I can avoid uh, eternity in hell that wasn't designed for me. I receive you, Lord. Write my name in your book. And help me every day to live in your love. So friends of LCC and all those listening, have I told you lately that I love you? Well, to my best ability, and I'm asking God to help me to learn how to love more, I love you. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today for Church at Home. And remember to like and share this service on Facebook so we can reach more people. And subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can get all the latest announcements of what we're doing. You can also visit our website, mylcc.ca, or download our free app. And before you go today, we want to take a moment to thank you for your generous giving. We have a wonderful church family, and even in these uncertain times, our church family has remained faithful to worship the Lord with their tithes and offerings. And because of your giving, we together have been able to help families in need weekly with groceries and support. So praise the Lord for that. If you have your offering with you, take it in your hand or grab your wallet or your mobile device, whatever you use to pay your bills, and we're going to pray a blessing over your finances today. And while you get ready at home, before we pray, I'm just going to read a couple scriptures from Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, there was a large crowd gathering around Jesus and the disciples. And the disciples asked him to send them away so that the people could go and buy food for themselves because it was getting late. But in verse 37, Jesus said to the disciples, you feed them. With what? The disciples answered him. We'd have to work for months to get enough food money to buy food for all of these people. Jesus said to them, verse 38, how much bread do you have? And after they looked around and figured it out, they came back and they said, we have five loaves and two fish. Verse 41, Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed them. Then breaking them into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so that they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish, and everyone had enough to share. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterwards, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. The Bible tells us in verse 44, there was a total of 5,000 men, plus their families that were fed that day. What an amazing miracle. Now let me encourage you with this truth today. God can take what you have and turn it into what you need. Not just in your finances, but in every area of your life, your relationships, in your peace, in your faith, in your talents, in everything. So trust God, give him what you find in your hand and he will bless it and he'll stretch it and he'll multiply it to meet the need. So let's pray this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for our church family and all of our friends who have so generously honored you with their tithes and offering. We just pray a blessing over them right now. Lord, you are the God of more than enough, so we're asking for you to take what they have in their hands and multiply it and stretch it and let it more than meet the need that they have. And Lord, we're believing that for each one, no matter what the economy is doing, no matter what this season looks like, 
that they will be blessed in their job, they'll be blessed in their finances, they will be blessed in their homes, in their families, their relationships, and that when they exit this season, as we will, that they will walk out stronger with more blessing in their life than how they walked in it. And we give you praise and thanks today. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed today. We'll see you next week.